Good morning, everybody. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you here this morning for our Glasgow Talks with Gillian Doherty, who's the Chief Exec of the Data Lab. Now, we're continuing our digital technology theme uh, today, following on from our session with Mark Logan just a couple of weeks ago. And as you'll probably know, uh, Mark was the author of the Scottish Technology Ecosystem Review. Now, we're very fortunate to have Gillian here as one of our very first chamber webinars at the outset of the lockdown. She joined us and gave us some of our own insights in terms of how she was able to respond with her team at Data Lab to the initial conditions of the lockdown environment. And I think even to this day, we're still following many of those suggestions and recommendations, including over communication with the team today. And I know that we had a lot of feedback from, from our members and all of you saying how valuable you find that. So today we're going to get some different perspectives from Gillian. Um, but first, before we, we crack on with the session, yeah, I'd just like to extend a very warm uh, thanks to the uh, Glasgow Talk sponsors uh, for their ongoing support, and that's indeed the University of Glasgow's Adams Business School and the Clydesdale Bank. <clears throat> We're going to have a question and answer session built into today's session, although Gillian and I are going to treat it as more of a conversation rather than a formal presentation. So we will ask you to use the chat function if you would like to bring a question in. I would ask if you wouldn't mind when uh, within your name context, if you just say the company that you represent and then the question thereafter, and I will do my best to bring that in. If we haven't managed to cover your questions, I'm sure that Gillian will be happy enough to, to, to allow us to come back to you with any specific things that you've raised if we aren't able to cover it during the session. So it's terrific to have Gillian here today. She's also our very own Deputy President here at Glasgow Chamber of Commerce, so she wears many hats. Uh, I get the great pleasure of being able to, to give you a little bit of background to Gillian. We've known Gillian since she was in her IBM seat um, and have worked closely with her along that journey uh, through um, her own career as she transitions through to the Data Lab. She's currently the Chief Executive of the Data Lab, and I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that in, in due course. But it's basically got a mission to help Scotland maximise value from data and lead the world to a powered, data-powered future. That's a big, bold uh, mission for somebody to have to lead. Now, she was appointed an OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2019 for services to information technology and business. And I certainly remember that that was a massive highlight for Gillian last year, and she was rightfully very proud to get that accolade. As I said, she was uh, previously at IBM for a long time, I think, many decades. And uh, she was a visiting professor at Robert Gordon University. She's been a TEDx speaker. And she was also named the digital leader in 2018 for the UK. So this is, a, we're, in, we're in very accomplished company this morning. <clears throat> she was also named the Chief Executive of the Year at the Digital Tech Awards in 2017. And was in the UK's top 10 most influential people in data, according to Data IQ. Now, today, as I've said, we're focusing predominantly in the tech space, but with a focus on data and AI. Now, many of you will have uh, been hearing a lot about data in the press, uh, particularly around the COVID response. And for those of you who were able to join us with the session with Professor Jason Leach just a couple of weeks ago, data has been talked about a lot in terms of how it's driving decisions. And of course, that's very topical today as we sit poised, ready to hear what iteration of next levers of lockdown that are going to be pulled both across the UK and in Scotland. And Jason was very, very focused in his, this is data driven, every single data decision is, is pushed by data through four different lenses. And it was a fascinating discussion. So we're going to unpick that a little bit during this conversation today as well with Gillian. But Gillian, many thanks for joining. Um, us today. Um, I think what would be really helpful to start off with is for those of us in the room who are perhaps not so familiar with what Data Lab actually is, could you just tell us a little bit about the organisation, what it does and what business you are about? Sure. Look, thank you very much, Alison, and thank you to the Chamber for the opportunity to join you this morning. And thank you to you all for joining so early on a, on a Tuesday morning, um, another call. Uh, so it's great to see you all. And the Data Lab is, it has been a fantastic, I guess, journey and, and it's been exciting to be involved in from its inception just over five years ago. And we're part of a bigger innovation centre programme, which 
was born from an understanding that our organisations as a whole in Scotland didn't invest in, in research and development to the same levels as our European or global counterparts. Um, investment in R&D is, is one of the indicators of better sustainability for a business and organisation, helping them to, to innovate and build new products and services. And also through the lens that we had some world leading academics who worked with organizations around the world, but didn't necessarily work with an organization down the street. So from that, that understanding and foundation, the Innovation Center program was born. It's predominantly funded through Scottish government and its agencies um, with the mission to drive economic and social benefit in our particular areas of strength or focus. And for us at the Data Lab, that's helping organisations innovate through data science and AI. As Alison, Alison mentioned, our mission, it is a big mission, but we believe one that actually we should go after with a certain vigour and um, passion. Um, and, and this kind of goes back to, to a line that I, I shared during my TED talk a few years ago in Glasgow, was that if, if we don't do it to ourselves, then someone will come and do it to us. Um, and I would much rather be in the, the driving seat, shaping how our organisations use data ethically and, and morally. And as we move towards um, new capability with AI, that we do so in a way that represents us as a nation, as a country uh, and us as citizens. So the Data Lab, we, we kind of generally have a, a range of services that we offer to organisations, both private organisations, commercial third sector and private sector, or public sector. And those services range from working with organizations identifying collaborative innovation projects, where we can deploy your data scientists to a particular project with the organization, or match them with one of our academics from our universities to work on collaborative projects. And those projects, for example, have ranged from working with the Beetson's Cancer Hospital on using computer vision algorithms to delineate tumors from healthy tissues and complex neck cancers, to working with a subsea pipeline inspection company, automatically annotating high definition video feed from the seabed for a new product they're developing, to working with a, a range of organizations supporting renewable offshore wind farms, and, and using predictive maintenance algorithms to help them maintain the, the offshore wind farm efficiently and effectively. So we've invested around 140 projects over the last five years. And those, as I say, those are just a few examples, but it touches every single sector um, and every uh, range of organization from, from small startups to multinationals. Uh, we've introduced a new service uh, in the last year or so, which is helping organisations secure innovation funding from outside of Scotland. And we've helped around 30 organisations bid for money, whether that's to Innovate UK, Horizon 2020, or other competitions that are available both at a UK, Europe or global level. And during that process, we've helped secure around £9 million of additional innovation funding into Scottish organisations, which is excellent to see. We've got a big range of skills and talent programmes, and I think we'll cover a little bit more of those in detail during the call. But they range from uh, our master's programme, where we fund studentships for masters. And uh, just hopefully in the coming weeks, we will see our 500th data science uh, master's student graduate. And we pull that cohort together for Meta Skill Training Innovation Challenge Week. And it was great this year to work with the Glasgow Chamber on a um, circular economy challenge. And some of the ideas from the teams were absolutely fantastic. They worked over uh, all 155 students from this year's cohort worked over a week um, virtually to come up with ideas uh, and share those. And, and I think um, we, we saw some of the results shared in the recent uh, magazine from the Chamber this week. Uh, we can fund uh, industrial doctorate programmes. We partner to run continuous professional development courses and content, and we've developed leadership training. So one of the things we realised uh, a few years ago was one of the biggest inhibitors for organisations doing more with their data was the awareness of leadership teams, executive teams and the boards of driving value from data. How do they begin? Why is it important for their business? How can they drive competitive edge? 
um, how can they get them himself into a position where they are disrupting the market rather than being disrupted. And so we've built a range of leadership training content, including an online learning course, which is actually free and running at the moment. So um, if, if you're interested in learning more, um, join, join in. Uh, and we've had over two and a half thousand people now through the online learning course and around over a thousand uh, through the face to face content as well, obviously pre COVID lockdown. Uh, and then building all of those things, you need a solid foundation of community is, is building a robust and supportive data community, not just here in Scotland, but out internationally. So building those international links across the world um, such that we can support foreign direct investment opportunities, uh, trade opportunities for our organisations who have data products and solutions, um, all the way through to attracting an international audience to come and see what we're doing in Scotland and why it's important. So it's a very quick run through, Alison, of some of the things we do, but I'm sure we might get a chance to explore more in, in detail later. That's fantastic, Gillian, and a brilliant scene setter indeed. Now, I suppose the last six, seven months has just been quite an extraordinary time. Um, as you've been going about your business, have you noticed that there's been a substantial shift to either increase or indeed decrease demand for the services that you're offering? And you know, what have you had to do yourself as a leader and also with the team to enable that shift? Sure. No, it has been an interesting six months for, for all of us. In terms of one of the areas that we were surprised we saw a huge amount of focus in was the external funding uh, application. So we got approached by a lot more companies um, looking to innovate uh, and do things differently, even early on in the lockdown. Uh, and that, that has been really positive because actually we've seen quite a lot of success. So we supported four companies to secure funding as part of the COVID call that Innovate UK had, um, each securing 50K of innovation funding. Um, one of those based in Glasgow, Game Doctor, who um, build uh, game technology to educate those in health and well-being. So they were building a, an app to educate school children on, on COVID, for example. Uh, and raise their awareness of what's going on. So I think external funding um, has seen a significant increase. And I think, I think all of the funding support packages that both Scottish Government, UK Government and, and others have made available have been highly sought after. But it, the, the area that we play is, is, is funding to actually innovate. So, so actually companies were not taking their eye off the ball in terms of innovating even through this period. We've certainly obviously not been able to deliver a lot of the services that we have face to face. Uh, we've seen probably a, certainly a dip in the leadership demand um, early on. That is now starting to come back. I think a lot of people just kind of paused to take stock of where things were for their own organisation and, and reprioritise. But I think the realisation certainly over the last two months is that actually we do need to get on and do the things we wanted to do for our business. So those services are, are slowly coming back. We've been excited by um, our new cohort starting, our master's cohort, and, and actually the universities have been um, positive about the response they've had from the studentships that we offer, which is, is great to see, albeit actually they will see a much staggered start date for some of those masters right through into early 2021. Um, for most of our projects have continued um, remotely uh, and, and that has, has worked well. We did see, obviously, a, we took a big hit in the master's placements because most of them take place face to face. Uh, last year, we had secured 100 placements in industry for our master's students. Um, and, and this year, unfortunately, we, we couldn't quite match that um, by a long way. But we did still manage to secure just under 40 virtual placements across a whole range of industries for our master's students. And we're now seeing the, the outcomes of some of those placements and projects that they worked on. So it's, it's definitely it's been swings and roundabouts, Alison, some up, some down. But I certainly feel in the last two months, people are realising, you know, we, we can't pause anymore um, mm -hmm. and reflect. We need to keep moving forward. 
So you, you're talking a little bit about leadership there, and I think it'd be interesting for everybody in the room to hear a wee bit more about that. So um, you, you mentioned, obviously, you've got your master's, you've got leadership specifically, and then you referenced the importance of leveraging data and the value of data at senior management at board level to enable that disruption mm -hmm. and, and innovation. Have you noticed or are you starting to change the way you're taking that leadership proposition out? Climate change being just one example that's very much back in, in the centre of people's minds as they enable recovery and how do they do that in a, in a better way uh, as a result of this particular crisis. And you know we are very passionate in, in Glasgow here about all things climate change and circular economy here in the chamber. So uh, have you got any observations on any shift in intention in terms of leadership? and things that maybe people in the room might want to be aware of? I think that it's probably work in progress. I think organisations are, are certainly looking at doing things differently um, coming out the back of this, whether, whether they are practical things like their, their buildings, transport, travel to work, how they support their clients. Um, there's been a huge amount of innovation, not just in the, in the public sector, but in the private sector as well of having to do things differently. And that has given organizations, in some cases, actually a, a huge level of confidence that maybe they didn't have before that things could mm -hmm. be done differently. And that's quite exciting to see. And certainly the reports I've read is, is we won't quite ever go back to exactly the way we were. And, I, and that, that's just evolution, that is, that's human nature. Um, but it'd be really great to see how as we come through this through 2021 and beyond, how some of the innovation and some of those collaborative partnerships that we have seen work so well in the last six months, the barriers coming down, the, the oh, we just couldn't possibly do that or we couldn't work with them. The landscape's changed and it'd be really exciting to see how we maintain that level of innovative collaboration between organisations and within organisations that we've seen. Innovative collaboration, very interesting, yes. And again, that's something where um, some of the we've been involved in the circular economy and the climate change has been powerful because it's unlikely collaborations or unexpected collaborations that are yielding some of the greatest creativity and innovation. So that's really interesting to hear. Now, in terms of data, data probably will mean a great many things to people in the room. So if we were going to unpack that a little bit, we've got you know the data suite, we've got big data, we've got open data, we've got actually a very granular level issues around GDPR data. Uh, it will mean many things to people um, in the audience. So could you maybe just tell us a little bit about what, what those things are um, and what do you think the biggest barriers are for organisations to do more with their data and to, to drive that added value that we were talking about earlier on? Yeah, it, it's... It's a question that gets asked quite a bit. So what, what is data? Well, it's really just any bit of information and, and it's it's not anything new. Um, I did a, a talk last week for um, a school kids competition called Stat Wars and it was on the World Ozone Day. Uh, and, and I was doing a wee bit of research for it. And back in the 1970s, um, Sherwood Rowland and Mario Molina were doing some data analysis of the impact of CFCs on the ozone layer. And, and there data analysis led to every country in the world signing up to the Montreal Protocol, which bans CFCs and, and, and has helped um, the repair of the ozone layer. And I think David Attenborough called it the, um, I'll get the words right, the greatest planetary action of our time. And it all started with two scientists looking at the data. Um, and that's quite exciting. And when you explain that, and when I explained that to, to the group of um, school children I was talking to, you know, it, it, it can start with just having an interest in a question. So it's all about having a question you want to answer. And can you then access data sources that will help you answer those questions, whatever they might be, whether they're that's data from your own organization, data you can get access to, acquire open data that's freely available um, for organizations to use. Um, then then it is essentially at, the, at its heart, and, and you asked about the barriers, um, it's about asking questions. So it's asking whether the right question, the business question, the strategy question, the what should we do next question. Uh, it's got to start with the right question because several years ago, you know, the, the hype was around big data and it was like, right, we'll just bring all the data together and we'll give it to these 
clever folk data scientists and they'll tell us something we don't know. And it's like, no, 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 hang on. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. You've got to start with a question you want to try and answer because um, otherwise it, it there's, there's no point that you, you will not make, make great progress. So starting with a question that you want to try and answer, um, do you have the right data? Do you have the team in place? Do you have the leadership? Um, and indeed, we've, we've done a piece of work over the last few years that's culminated in a, uh, and, and you'll be able to get, I'm happy to share this, a kind of customer readiness matrix in terms of your organizational readiness to do things with data and your uh, your data readiness. So where are you on the data maturity level? And from an organization perspective, what are the key things we think you need to be able to help you? Whether as that's leadership, strategy, investment, uh, infrastructure, governance, and that covers both the uh, legally GDPR, other regulations if you're in a regulated industry, but also uh, ethics, which I think is a, is a key element as well. So the biggest barriers, I think, is, is awareness, leadership, then skills. How do you build the right teams? How do you get the right data skills you need, the right leadership skills you need to be able to maximize the opportunity for the organization? Wow, a lot in that. Right. So I think there's some really, really punchy stuff in there for, for the audience there in terms of, you know, drilling down to the correct question. And actually, sometimes that's really difficult. <laughs> what is the question you want to answer? Um, and then how do you go about making sure you've got the right team, the right leadership? Um, and I'm, I'm sure everybody will be really happy to receive the customer readiness matrix if, you're, if you are if you are sharing that. So thank you for that. So if we bring it into a kind of contemporary space today, uh, we mentioned at the beginning uh, Jason Leach and, and the work that all the, the, the clinical directors and so are using all this data to try and inform decisions to make the best approach in terms of this sort of pandemic thing that we are in just now. And in the last six months, as you were recently quoted in the Scotsman, I think, saying something along the lines of, you know, every day we're told we're analyzing the data, we're looking at the evidence and it's informing what we're doing. And that's been a big fundamental shift in terms of language and also direct intention at a much more public level. So do you think that there's been an impact on business and the business community in terms of greater awareness of, of of understanding of what that means to use data in that way and how it's deployed. I think so. I think I think the the the, the context of the quote was generally. I think we've we've raised the level of your the citizen awareness or, or citizens awareness of of data because every day we're hearing that same you know that that same quote, um, and I think that's only a positive thing. Uh, and I said something similar a, a few years ago during the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, as as awful as it was, and 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 even more is coming out now um, about how these social media giants use data. But actually, it, it made more people question what what exactly is happening. What 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 is data? What are they what are they doing? What are they using? And I think. <clears throat> organizations are, are looking at at different levels and depending on where their priority is through through the um, pandemic from survival so the resilience data financial data planning data um, modeling data lots more modeling going on i think in organizations mm -hmm. that maybe they they hadn't quite had the same lens uh, through that because we were you know what happened last month or, or comparing numbers to last year and quarter on quarter and, and all of those things and supply and demand and, and, and cash flow, you know, organizations were, were regularly doing this. Now I think there's much more horizon scanning, um, resilience planning, forecasting, modeling, prediction, and then seeking other ways of doing things. So again, putting that innovative question in, is there a different way we can do this? Uh, and I think, that, that not, not only is the pandemic, I think we've seen a transition to that over the last few years. I think we've still got a way to go. I don't think every organization um, is quite there yet. And that's not a bad thing. You know, we, we get a lot of organizations that come and talk to and say, we, we've got all this data. We don't know where to start. We know we should be doing more. And almost there's a kind of, and we feel like we're really far behind. And actually, in a lot of situations, they're not. You know, everyone's kind of in the same boat. We're, we're working through this together. I think the key thing for us is how do we create that rising tide for, for all boats to, to float and get, get better? Um, whether, no matter where they are, whether they're at the start of their journey or whether they're at the complex machine learning, high performance compute level of, of algorithm 
um, development and analysis for whatever they're doing. Uh, and it's for Scotland, there's a, there's, and, and for every country in the world, there's a big range. So, so how do we create services and opportunities and help to, to move everyone to the next box in that readiness scale? And I suppose, given the, 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 the sort of speciality of your organisation is data and AI in this whole field, is it fair to actually ask you the question, are you doing that yourselves? I mean, are you asking questions yourselves of your own <laughs> modelling and how you're behaving and how you're doing things? And if so, are you able to share what that's been like and how you've gone about that? Because I think that would be tremendously helpful for people to hear. Well, actually, we did. We when we developed the, the this uh, organisational readiness and, and data readiness, we we did it on ourselves. Um, we got our, our leadership team and some other key people in our organisation to complete that analysis, uh, which is really interesting as well. When you get different people in the same organisation completing the same uh, review, because you will get the diversity of answers, um, and that could lead to. Uh, I guess a, an awareness of actually we've got investment in, in finance, but we don't have investment in the supply chain area. Um, so it could lead to an awareness or a lens that you can look through to see is the organization at different parts or is there just generally a, a mismatch in terms of uh, understanding. Um, we are not at the top right hand box. Um, I would love to say we were. Um, we do analyse a lot more of our uh, project data, the kind of projects that are successful, the ones that are leading to more revenue for the companies we help. What's the kind of shape of those? Um, is there a, a kind of magic sauce or a recipe that they're that kind of size, that type of technology, they're answering this kind of question, they've worked with this kind of group of academics. Is there a recipe that makes a project more successful than another project? So I would say, Alison, it's work in progress, but probably the same as a lot of organisations. But we're very aware we do need to take our own medicine. Yes, and that's not always easy to do. I hear you. So uh, thank you for being so honest about that. Now, I'd like to kind of take you into the, the space because you brought it up there uh, around ethics. Now, uh, I did recently watch Social Dilemma on Netflix, and I'm sure some of the audience will have also watched that. And that was certainly an eye-opener, and I suppose a lot of things that were said in that are not a surprise, but I, see, I suppose seeing it all in the one space at the one time was a little bit of an assault on the senses. And I think, you know, for those who have not seen it, it, it's a documentary, really, with contributors from all the big social media creators, inventors, engineers, vice presidents, and so on and so forth, former ones, I should add, who are giving their perspective on what we're doing to ourselves at the moment. And it's absolutely fascinating. So the bit I would like to hone in on around is the kind of observation that Facebook doesn't sell data, for example. Uh, the observation was made around it's what they do with the data. And then there's all kinds of throwaway comments made about the, the whole ambition is a machine around commercial gain for the, the advertisers to make us as individuals shift our behavior by 1%. Wow. Um, and, and then, and then, and the resulting, you know, negative, deliberately mm -hmm. executed, addictive behaviours that they're trying to instil in us in order that they get that commercial gain, mental health issues, a whole lot of stuff in there. So I'm not going to take you into that bit, but what I would like you to do is to talk a little bit about the role of AI and the observations about artificial intelligence already ruling the world and how these algorithms that these guys are, and girls are creating uh, have a mind of their own and that humans have lost control of the systems already. So what are your observations on that and how data and artificial intelligence are being used? And what would you say is particularly cognizant for the, for the business, uh, what's particularly of relevance for the business community to take cognizance of? Yeah, that's a big question. Thanks for that, Alison, on a Tuesday morning. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I did uh, watch Social Dilemma and uh, obviously closely followed all of the Facebook Cambridge Analytica. I interviewed Christopher Wiley, who was the whistleblower for that um, two years ago. Um, so it's an area that I, I guess I'm fascinated by in, in, in lots of kind of different ways. In terms of the the nudge behaviour of what I found fascinating about the social dilemma is the, is the classes, you know, the, is it Trist, Tristan Harris, who's one of the key um, execs, ex Google execs, you know, you, there's a classes at Stanford on cognitive behaviour uh, and how you nudge people. Um, and, and the whole kind of premise is the, the business model of these social media giants is, is 
is the advertising. So it's about eyeballs. They're, they're, they're feeding you things to try and keep your eyeballs on the screen such that they can increase their advertising revenue. And they're trying to find any, any way of doing that um, at, at its core. Um, and they have built, you know, machine learning algorithms that will, uh, that learn essentially what will keep you most, um, at, you know, with your phone or, or, or on these platforms longer than, than otherwise. And, and these, these algorithms learn um, with, with all of the data they're gathering from more, everyone that participates in these platforms, they're learning more around, well, actually, you know, I need to feed you this next thing. And, and I think the docudrama did it very well in terms of how they articulated that uh, in a way that, that um, was important. In terms of the, the scary side, I think um, that, that came through quite clear a few years ago was, was behaviours around how they're manipulating you to think like a herd of others. So they will only show things on your feed that reinforce certain behaviours. Um, and that's almost the, the, the really kind of unpleasant, scary element of this. Um, in terms of uh, businesses, you know, it was really interesting. I don't, you know, they they had a whole range of ex executives who who clearly had all operated in this uh, this space, uh, and now you know have have made some awareness that actually this isn't right, and have stepped back from it. And many of them now are are founders of um, humane technology type uh, organisations and and organisations that are wanting to shift this balance. Uh, in terms of business organisations, I think what's really key is is at embedding those ethical and moral questions all the way through. Particularly um, if you're using, uh, if you've a direct B two C consumer and you've got customer data, are are you doing things that align with your values as an organisation and, and the values of your customers, the values of your suppliers? Uh, it it should never ever be a bolt on at the end, um, and there's been a lot of a lot more, should we say, dialogue, questions, research papers, help around that ethics and moral space uh, in the last two years than there was before, certainly, uh, and a lot of that came out of of that um, Cambridge Analytica scandal and the, and the questioning there. Um, so I think f for us, you know, it, it, it's about having the diversity of teams working on these things uh, because actually if you don't have a diverse team there's a great saying if you don't have a diverse team building the algorithm the algorithm will be biased um, diverse teams working on these things um, ethics and, and built in all the way through um, contemplating and, and trying to trying to think of the unintended consequences of some of these things but also a plan because there will, you know, you, you just can't, I don't think, in every circumstance conceive a, a possible outcome or, or unintended consequence. So how are you going to react if something happens that, that is unintended? What, what, what is your, what is your uh, approach to that should, should that happen? Um, because you, you, unfortunately, in a lot of organ in a lot of circumstances, you can't foresee everything that might happen. Um, so it's really complicated space. Uh, but um, what was encouraging, you know, you know, towards the end, is that actually there, there's some technology and data and data science and, and AI have made huge differences. So. It's about balance. It's you know I mentioned that project earlier with the Beatsons and and the cancer. There's a fantastic project we were involved in with Fit Homes in Inverness, um, building algorithms that monitor or take data from sensors and predict when uh, tenants have a higher probability of falling. And that combined with other technology in the home have allowed people to have for their first ever opportunity to live independently. So there are huge positives from technology. Um, but we must be cognizant and aware of the those unintended consequences and, and sometimes, unfortunately, the bad actors that are also at play. Um, not here in Scotland, obviously, Alison, but elsewhere. Not here in Scotland. Well, th thank you. That, that was a very comprehensive answer. It was a very tricky area. And I think the fact that um, a reminder, a start reminder of everybody being very clear about what their value set is as an organisation is probably quite a good challenge check for, for us all to do on a regular basis. 
and then go on the next stage of the journey, taking some of that into account in terms of the changes and the shifts. Now, I suppose on that note, um, let's let's look a little bit around the skills agenda and perhaps uh, the next gen skills and what's going to be required and what's coming through. So, you, you know, the chamber uh, obviously hosts the Developing Young Workforce uh, Glasgow Regional Group here, and the, there are some exciting discussions underway at the moment around hopefully uh, responding to some of the more recent digital recommendations that have been made, and we'll come on to that shortly also. But in terms of digital tech and how, how technology is, is embraced into the curriculum and how um, that's done in a more robust way in terms of you know, computing and digital being seen as comparably important to the likes of maths and physics um, and how we go about all of that through partnerships with local authorities, education departments and, and government and so on and so forth and skills development Scotland. How big a challenge do you think it's going to be to change the talent pipeline and I'm just, I'm going to say that in the context of what you've just been saying about values and mindful that this next generation obviously will have a slightly different value set, which will be possibly much more in the ethical space and the climate um, ambition space and so on and so forth. But how difficult do you think it's going to be to get that balance between new coming in and boards making decisions uh, at a strategic level and how, how those two worlds uh, connect and meet? Um, I, I think... Is it a challenge? Clearly, there, there is a level of challenge there. Um, but, you know, I also listened to, to Mark's um, session two weeks ago and and, and it, it was also put to him about this, the skills and how difficult it will be to change this, the school structure and things. Kind of my um, view is we've got to do it. We don't have a choice. Um, this is the future. This um, digital skills more broadly in every job, but actually the, the core of, of enabling our organisations to take opportunities, we, we've got to um, do something more. And, and the key thing is we can do it in, in, in we can do lots of smaller things. Um, and that was also Mark's point, you know, uh, um, the work that uh, is being done um, in S Smart Stems, in uh, Tony Scullion, who's a fantastic um, advocate and computing science teacher um, with uh, Turing testers and encouraging more girls into computing. Um, it can be done. There was just this week, actually, Professor Sue Black, who's um, co-founder of Tech Mums, a big, you know, she's, she led the campaign to save Bletchley Park. Um, Durham University hired her with a specific focus of getting more girls into computing science. Um, and this goes back to her diversity um, comment earlier. And they have doubled the number of girls getting into computing science at Durham University in one year. And, you know, they say, no, oh, how did you do that? You know, it's impossible. And they just had some really clear things. They went out and spoke to girls. They made sure that actually all of the open days, there was 50% uh, male and female lectures, 50% male and female students talking to the future students. You know, there were some really specific things, not massively difficult, um, that they did. Um, now, clearly, when we go right back to, to primary schools, you know, it's, it's just more, more activity, smaller activity that builds up to that bigger picture, I think, is the key thing. Um, and... You know, we've made some great strides. You know, I know with uh, Skills Development Scotland and, and SQA, we've been working on the um, National Performance Award for Data Science, first in the UK, School Award for Data Science. That's fantastic. Um, how do we excite and enthuse our, our children about the opportunities in digital and tech jobs? Um, there's a big campaign just now that Smart Stems is running to, to get people to record little videos. If you're, if you're in or work in a digital type job of the job you do and what, do, what is your day like um, and a bit about your journey. Um, I love the phrase, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So it's about showing, you know, giving them role models, um, you know, right across the board. Um, there's, there's great programs. Um, there's the Dell STEM Aspire program, which I know there's some people on the call that participate as mentors in that, encouraging girls and, um, through, through computing science courses. Uh, is it a challenge? Yes. Is it insurmountable? No. And you know how much we love to rise to a challenge here in Bonnie, Glasgow. So thank you very much for that. Now, we have got our first question from the audience. Um, I would just like to remind the audience, please share your questions as we're going along and I will, I will bring those in accordingly. So 
The first question is actually from Gary Bernstein, who is of Tech Leaders, and he is stating that the UK was ranked fifth in the 2020 Global Innovation Index. And then he's saying, which sectors can help Scotland, the UK, move up the global rankings by exploiting data expertise? And of course, how does Glasgow feature in that? Hmm. Um, well, one of the key areas for Glasgow is, is financial services and fintech. Um, and it's a huge area for Scotland. You know, we've got a great organisation, cluster management organisation, Fintech Scotland. Um, I think we've, they've just... A, won another award for for the work they do in terms of that and our fintech organizations um, really have a global reputation of innovating through data um, not just you know well across scotland but also glasgow is massively strong in that so you've seen huge investment over the last few years jp morgan barclays morgan stanley um, thousands and thousands of jobs uh, in glasgow and a, you know, a huge percentage of them are actually in tech. In fact, almost all of them. So, you know, JP Morgan have got, you know, their, their centres in Glasgow are, are part of their three global centres of excellence in data and cyber and cloud in Glasgow. Um, it's probably not well known, but it's here. Um, and they do that because of the talent that, that we have. Um, so I think financial services, fintech, I think energy and energy transition, particularly in, in renewables. So actually data is often at that, the heart of, of that transition um, of the challenge that, that we have. And we've been involved in, in quite a lot of projects there. The other area that I think is growing is, is space. So the use of um, satellite imagery, data from space in, in new opportunity. We've obviously got the the recent approval for the launch um, area in Inverness. Glasgow is the, the CubeSat capital. Uh, more CubeSats built in Glasgow than, than anywhere else. So I think we've got a great foundation um, across sectors like that. I, I think the public sector's also got a huge role to play. Um, coming out of this pandemic, actually, could we really have a public sector that leads the world in how to use data and AI to improve the lives of citizens uh, right across the board and, and improve society benefits from these types of technologies i think we we're a great size to be able to do that we're not you know i call it the kind of goldilocks economy we're not too big or too small but actually you can get your hands around it and we've certainly found that from engaging with organizations uh, who are looking at scotland to come and invest and and build their teams here is the view that actually you're, you're never one step away from whether that be a minister, whether that be someone that could be a great supplier to you, a great collaborative partner, an academic, and um, the talent. And I think we need to really use that to our advantage. Great. So you, you've mentioned um, a, a lot of different subject areas. I'm going to just hone in uh, for the purpose of argument around the energy and energy transition and renewable space. So if we um, we we kind of put a different set of specs on and start looking at the climate change agenda again. Uh, as you know, uh, in Glasgow, there's a lot of work being done in sustainable Glasgow, the ambition for net zero by 2030. Uh, the chamber itself and its members have been uh, they involved around circular economy as an innovation driver and actually tech being a huge part of that and the role that AI, robotics and, and bio and so on and so forth all will play within that tech space. If you were going to talk a little bit more about the circular space and the opportunity for business in that, what would you say and how quickly do you think businesses can embrace data and tech to support the climate change ambition? So as I say, Glasgow's really specifically nailed its colours to the mast in terms of net zero by 2030. And I know you've got a lot of work going on with, with students, the MFCs that you referenced earlier. So this is more specifically about how quickly do you think businesses will be able to embrace data and tech specifically to help with some of that climate ambition? Um, I think there's a huge amount of opportunity to do that um, quickly uh, and to get help. I think that's the key thing. I think uh, if there's no help there, it's, it's often difficult to navigate these things on your own. So through the innovation centres, not just the data lab, but the um, census who specialise in sensors and IoT, the new 5G centre that has just been uh, uh, launched uh, and the investment in the four hubs that was announced last week, there are groups that can help. So, you know, I think you can start quickly and, the, and there's a lot of help out there. So it's just about helping you navigate that, that landscape to get to the fastest help possible. 
Um, there's other opportunities for for funding. Digital Boost has just been announced, another set of funding that will help organisations in their digital journey. Um, a digital development loan, um, 0% interest up to 100k. So there, there are programmes and then you've got those kind of more uh, or larger uh, competitions like Innovate UK, Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund and others where you can get access to funding that can help you on that journey. So I think my key thing is don't do it on your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, reach out and get help through the chamber. The chamber can connect you with other organisations that can help. Um, and can you move quickly? Yes, you can. Um, but you'll move much more quickly by getting help from the right organisations and support, including funding if that is uh, if that is possible. Um, but that, that will make it much more achievable uh, in a quicker time scale than, than, than trying to do these things on your own. Okay, so you've mentioned also um, during the conversation here today, you've mentioned Mark Logan's report and we mentioned that at the outset as well. So <clears throat> he was just here with us two weeks ago and he's the author, as I say, of the Scottish Tech Ecosystem Review. Would you like to just share some of your thoughts and observations on that report and, dare I say, do you think it's ambitious enough? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. So, yeah, so... Um, my thoughts is I think it's an excellent report. I think it's one of the best I've I've seen, and I think that that echoes a lot of the commentary that's come out um, about the report. I think it's been very well received, not just by government but by other organisations. I know the Fraser of Allender Institute, for example, um, uh, were, were really positive about it as well. Is it ambitious enough? I think it's uh, yes, but I think it's ambitious in a way that is is really practical. Has he clearly read? You know, laid out. You know what, thirty-four or so recommendations. They were very well uh, articulated. Um, he shared how he thinks that could be done, how the process could be managed, how you actually need to look at it in the round, and not at each. You know, and break it down into individual things and and measure them to death. Uh, I think he articulated the opportunity. So, so bridging that gap between the narrowing of the funnel and, and the, the widening of the funnel well. Um, and the priorities in terms of education first, um, the kind of infrastructure uh, ecosystem, uh, and, but second, and then the funding third was, was the right way to go. Because um, as he said, you know, you could give a company, you know, 10 million pounds, but actually if they can't get the talent they need to develop, um, it doesn't really matter. So uh, there was some short-term, really quick recommendations that can be done and, and start to impact the, the widening of that funnel quickly. And then the longer tail element is certainly around that um, restructuring around uh, education, the importance of computing science and, and, and that tail that we're going to need to bring through people who are currently in primary all the way through to the entrepreneurs that he talks about. And then within the report, um, he talked, you know, he had some very specific things around a programme of support and how it could be measured across his recommendations. But specifically in the area of local uh, versus global optimisation. And if you take that back out again, can you tell us what you think about the challenges in that area in terms of the local versus global ambition? Yeah, so it might just, and just in case people haven't read the report, um, the local versus global, it wasn't generally a, a kind of um, geography thing. It was more around how you measure the interventions. So uh, generally, and, and this is probably not unique to Scotland, but essentially, and, and I can say this because I, I do get public funding to do the work that we do at the data lab. Um, you get a set of KPIs and you will do 10 of these and five of those and 15 of those and 15, 55 of those. Um, and I think Mark's point is if, if you measure each of those interventions just in a very narrow way, and that's what he kind of calls managing to the to the local optimization, um, versus looking at, at the bigger picture, the, the kind of global. So um, his point was you need to do all of these things and don't measure each one in isolation because if you do, you're missing the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is widening that funnel at the end and getting a much more, you know, post-tipping point scale um, ecosystem. Uh, now, the way we generally tend to do this um, is that if, you know, whatever you do, whether it's the innovation centres, whether it's digital boost, um, digital extra, digital development loan funding, any of those things, you know, you, you get an intervention and then you get a set of 
objectives, KPIs, whatever you want to do that, that, that will drive you down a set of behaviours. Um, and I think Mark's point was really interesting is that actually you need to step back from that and look at it in the round. Now, that's a big challenge because um, the way we've been programmed is that's how we do things. That's how we measure things. And we, we put, you know, and if you don't hit those things, then are you being successful or not? But actually, how do you look at the, the macro level um, and in his words, the global, you know, a Scottish level of uh, output. So more org more startups, more people at each part of the funnel, um, more skills. Uh, and if you if you narrow down the, the measurement of that too much, actually you get a, a set potentially of, of competing avenues, um, which is quite challenging. So um, it's quite a complicated area and, and I think it's an interesting one to touch on because that will be one of the challenges of making sure that as we go through and, and implement these recommendations, we do so in a way that actually meets the macro objective rather than, than manage things each in a kind of siloed basis. So, um, yeah, difficult one. You'll be, you'll be used to that with DYW, Alison. You know, we do five of those and 10 of those and we'll create that impact. Actually, what's the macro level and the, the, yeah, the bigger picture? And, and that's hard because um, securing any kind of funding, it's not a case of you get the funding and then just leave us to get on with it. It doesn't really happen that way. Absolutely. And I mean, that's that's one of the questions actually just come in from, from one of the audience, uh, Evelyn Walker. She's, she's specific, you've mentioned Digital Boost and Scottish Enterprise and high funding and Innovate UK, obviously, and the, the Industry 4.0 funding as well. So she's specifically asking a funding in, uh, question around entrepreneurs, SMEs, scale-ups who are in sectors of around health tech, med tech and edutech. She's asking what kind of data innovation advice would you give to those specifically? Because a lot of those bigger funding pots are, are, are more geared at the bigger guys. Um, I think actually there's a huge opportunity in, in places like Innovate UK. Um, there's been another just round of uh, interventions um, by Scottish Enterprise last week for tech businesses. Uh, there's uh, also competitions that you can enter uh, kind of more broadly, um, not specifically for tech, but um, Scottish Edge uh, and, and others who who have funding for for innovation and for entrepreneurs and startups. Uh, so I think it's the the biggest challenge is actually there's there's so much out there. How do you navigate to the right thing for you? Um, that's actually probably the bigger challenge. Um, and we're trying to get our head around that just now as well at the Data Lab, is how do we help organisations navigate really quickly to the thing that's most relevant to them, that's going to have most chance of success and least amount of time and effort? Because one of the, 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 the biggest and, um, should we say, the, the most constraint thing for a startup is, is time. So what you don't want to be doing is spending all your time applying for all these things when actually, you know, if you can get some help to pinpoint the exact one that, that's most applicable uh, and then the help to make sure that's you're optimising your probability of success of that application, the better. Now, we've got a few minutes left, so I would briefly like to just touch on the AI strategy for Scotland, a uh, work that you have been instrumental in, in doing um, and so can you tell us a little bit about the need for that strategy in Scotland, but quite specifically, what do you hope to see in terms of the outcome of the strategy for our businesses? Yeah, so we've, I guess, with them, um, I guess some har har haranguing is probably not the right word, some encouragement we were, you know, talking with Scottish Government and saying, look, you know, it would be great to coalesce behind an AI strategy for Scotland, one which puts our citizens at the heart that ultimately aligns the interventions to, to help deliver across that national performance framework, for example. Uh, and our supporting role in that was bringing that wider group of contributors through a series of working groups to contribute to that AI strategy through public engagement um, activity uh, and workshops and also a public consultation as to what our, our broader organisations, citizens, academia, et cetera, would like to see from that AI strategy. Uh, due to COVID, it has been delayed, so it's likely to be launched early in 2021. Um, but what I would like to see from that is, is real practical steps and interventions uh, and investments to actually, uh, for us to coalesce behind and for our organisations in Scotland to understand actually doing AI right in Scotland um, 
is laid out in that strategy. And it's an area that, that you know, many countries in the world are laying out. You know, we will not compete with the US and China in terms of money and investments and the you know, hundreds of billions of pounds of investment. But what does it mean for us? And it's almost back to that comment I'd made earlier that we need to do it for ourselves. We need to set our direction because if we don't, then we're walking almost zombie-like into the kind of social dilemma piece where it will be done to us. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. I would like to, for us to set our pathway forward uh, so that it, it's right for us as a country, our values as a, as a society and for our children that are, are going to come to follow. So we've got a couple more questions in here, which I would like to pick up. One um, is actually around uh, young girls, particularly in the disadvantaged space. Now, you've kind of covered that a bit already, and we can perhaps revisit that um, uh, offline. There's also a specific question around people who might want to switch career as a result of the pandemic conditions. And that's coming in from Gary Bernstein, and he's actually specifically saying, what advice would you have for them and what support options do they have to best support that transition? Yeah, and I mean, that's a great question, Gary. And actually, we've, we've seen it um, not just now, but over the last few years. And in fact, more than 50% of our master's cohort are, are mature students retraining. In fact, our student of the year had been made redundant from HSBC, retrained in a master's in data science and got a dream job in the third sector, which is something she always wanted to do. Um, so uh, there is a huge amount of help. Um, our masters is just one of them. There's a whole suite of courses at Code Clan. Uh, there are more work, more work being done right now by the college sector in terms of content. There's uh, there's about to be a, a new announcement for data skills and work um, vouchers that will become available to to do data co courses uh, through probably the college sector and over the next year. So um, I think explore the opportunity. The, the other thing is there's some great meetup communities and things to get involved in just to get a taster. Uh, in fact, Equate Scotland, uh, and this might uh, not necessarily girls, girls but, but women, uh, are running a session in a, in a few weeks, um, a kind of three-day taster session. We are doing a day on data. Code Clan are doing two days on, on software engineering to give um, a group of women the, the opportunity to to, to explore and, and to test, you know, is it this path or, or that path I want to go down? And we've got some great examples of people who have done it really, really successfully uh, and made that transition. So again, there's, there's a huge range of, of places to go and get help. Uh, there's a, another, you know, suite of offerings for apprenticeships as well that may be relevant for some people. So yeah, probably worth a, a list, um, Gary, to, to, to help to point people to. Now, Gavin Smith earlier on asked a question specifically about Edinburgh and Edinburgh's ambitions to be the data capital of uh, Europe outside London. Um, and, you know, do you think that that's something that any one place can own? And he's specifically saying, do you view this as a sector specialism or an enabling platform as part of that? And in addition to that, I'm going to say as a closing question within that context, What's making you most excited about Glasgow's future in technology and specifically in data? Um, so about Edinburgh's ambition, I don't think it's a bad thing to have an ambition. You know, it, it's the anchor of the um, a large piece of funding through the Edinburgh and city region deal, which actually stretches from uh, kind of um, St Andrews right down to the border. So it's, it's kind of bigger just than Edinburgh as a city. Um, I think they have a, a huge amount of foundational uh, capability through the university, through the work they've done um, in entrepreneurs, through the, the work around tech startups. Um, it's the most buoyant outside of London. So I think there's some great ingredients there. Actually, for me personally, you know, we're Scotland's innovation centre. So I think Scotland is, for me, an area where actually we can have great strengths across our entire country. Um, and I think that should be our ambition. Um, but actually, uh, and Edinburgh are a key part of that. So uh, I, d I don't think it's about owning. I think it's great to have an ambition, but actually 
our entire country have has opportunities in, in all of the various regions to, to lead in some way and, and whether that's through a particular sector focused whether it's tourism renewables space financial services fintech um, then there's there's great strengths across um, everywhere or, or I, guess, I guess foundations that we can build on and for Glasgow I, I, I'm really excited about the opportunity from Glasgow. I mean, we've seen huge investment from the big guys. That that's that's a great foundation to start from. What I'd like to see now is that is that buoyancy of entrepreneurship and startups um, through to the kind of larger um, growing tech businesses, but also our industrial heartland of Glasgow actually. All of those companies can use data better, whether it's it's um, Weird Group or um, Babcock or actually that industrial heritage as well. Um, it's not just about the new tech startups. Actually, if our organisations, no matter what sector they're in, can use data and AI to improve and build new products and services, build operational efficiency that's a great thing. You've got uh, the National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland being um, uh, built in in Renfrewshire, you know you've you've got a a huge wealth of different industries that can all benefit. So I think it's about taking those organisations on their journey, uh, but also then enabling that that new kind of tech um, ecosystem through the innovation zones that the city has, both uh, on the foundations of Glasgow and Strathclyde universities. Super. Well, listen, what a tremendous uh, extent of content we've gone through today. So thank you very, very much for, for being so thorough and, and frank and honest. Um, we've covered everything from AI, data, global to local. We've talked about the observations around businesses' intention to innovate, which has been quite a significant transition over the last uh, six or seven months, and that confidence to do things differently. Uh, a very clear message which is have the right question that you want to answer as a business and some of the, the subcomponents within that then you've mentioned around the modeling data and the shift in terms of how businesses are wanting to behave um, we talked a little mm -hmm. bit in the ethical space and the moral implications of that and just checking in with your own value set as a business and the influence of the skill set we covered Glasgow PLC. We talked about all the different sectors and opportunity for that, but then just uh, laterally there, the opportunity around the industrial heartlands heritage and the opportunity for that, because it is easy to just end up talking about the technology sector and tech businesses only. So I think that's a very salient point for us to wrap up on. So very many thank yous to Gillian for an excellent session. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors, the University of Glasgow Adam Smith Business School and the Clydesdale Bank. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining us here today again and for your support. Thanks to Alan for making sure everything's smooth, running smoothly and for Susan who was standing ready to be back up as my internet connection was a bit fluxy this morning. And Alan has indeed posted the information for our next Glasgow Talks with Derek Sovin from AGS Airports on the 20th of October. Have a great day one and all. Thank you very much.